you have your Bibles with me, turn to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. We're going to look at the greatest gift ever. The greatest gift ever. Let me go ahead and give you the outline today. Number one, the wise men. The wise men. Number two, the troubled king. The troubled king. And number three, the greatest gift ever. The greatest gift ever. You know, I absolutely love the Christmas season. Uh, the trees, the lights, the decorations, uh, presents. Uh, we had our family Christmas yesterday, and uh, we are blessed, folks. We are a blessed nation. Uh, we are a blessed people. And uh, lots of cookies and candy I have had. And uh, I was told today, if you announce it, they will do it. And that is true. <laughs> All right. And I even reflect, reflected back uh, growing up, there's two presents that stood out in my mind. And the first one was my first baseball mitt. I was five years old when I started playing baseball. And I got a new mitt for Christmas. And I thought, there can't be anything better than that. And then a couple of years later, I saw this bicycle down at one of the department stores. And by the way, it wasn't Walmart, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying it was a local store. And this bicycle, I'll never forget it because I could identify it any time I needed to. It was a red bicycle with a green seat. And in that day, you just didn't see those things. And I'd go down there every day after school. We only lived about five blocks from this store. I'd go down there, and in the window was that bicycle. And I'm telling you, Christmas morning, and I really didn't know. I, I wasn't, you know, I was, you know, five years old, and you talk about a, a five-year-old praying. I was praying that I could have that bicycle. And do you know, I got that bike. And four days later, it was stolen. Stole my bike. But the story ends well. A friend of mine had seen it at an apartment complex. And it was under a stairwell kind of hidden back in there uh, where a friend of his was. And my dad, I never will forget it. He knocked on the door by the stairwell. And he said, I think you have my son's bike. The man goes, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, you haven't seen that bike? I've never seen that bike. And he says, well, I'm going to take that bike. And he said, you can take my, that bike. My dad was kind of big, all right? He wasn't small. And we went down there and got my bike back. And the reason I tell you that, it parallels with the story I'm about to tell you and that you know. While all heaven rejoiced, Satan is always up to something, folks. All right? He is always up to something. I'm not trying to get a negative spin to this. I'm just telling you how it is. Think of all that we've been through this year. I mean, what's the first thing you think of is you think of COVID and all the deaths and all of the restriction and all that's going on. But I am here to tell you today, folks, we have reason to celebrate the birth of our King. And if you will just stop and not think about the negative things. Negative things happen to everybody. Nobody is exempt. Everyone. Everyone. And focus this week on the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In Matthew chapter 1, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born, and again, it was about a year later, if you're just looking for it chronologically, in Bethlehem, and we know Bethlehem was about five miles south of Jerusalem. It was a small town. It was kind of a sleepy town uh, compared to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was where uh, you know, all the feasts were. Jerusalem was where the temple was. Uh, Jer Jerusalem was where Jesus was crucified. So it was a huge town. But Bethlehem was a small town in the days of Herod the king. And folks, you have to understand uh, Herod was not a good person, and I will, he was called Herod the Great, and I'll, I'll clue you in in just a minute uh, on that. Behold, the wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and, I have, and have come to worship him. So you see that they came from the east, and uh, the group itself, uh, you have to ask yourself, you know, who are these wise men? And 
There's all, you know, tradition says there were three of them. All right, but history says there was probably much more than that. There may have been three kings and three wise men like that, but there was a whole entourage there. And the reason you will see in Scripture is because they drew the attention of a lot of folks uh, when they came. And they came from the east. So I got to look in, and uh, you, you can trace them far as back as the book of Daniel. Okay, and Daniel uh, lived in a pagan society. And, uh, you, know, you know, Nebuchadnezzar himself had these so-called wise men, and uh, part of their job was to interpret dreams. Okay, and they, you know, Nebuchadnezzar had that dream and uh, they just could not interpret them. But Daniel interpreted them and we know the story of Daniel uh, in the lion's den. And so it says, uh, for we have seen his star in the east. Uh, They were very smart men. They were astrologers. Uh, They had some, we would even list them as scientists. Okay, Uh, they were called magi and Again, I don't think it was all wrapped around the occult. Some people think that is, and and there are occulted things in that, okay? But the reason I say they're not, they they set their purpose right off the bat. We are looking for the king of the Jews. So somebody had taught them Jewish history, and I believe some of them could possibly have been saved because they were looking for the the Christ child. And you have to understand, they came a long ways looking. It took a lot of money uh, to, to travel that far. It took uh, a lot of organization and, and getting people together and, and going that far. So we see they asked the question, where is he who is born king of the Jews? For he, we have seen his star in the east and we come to worship him. So they were worshipers. They were seekers. And folks, I am telling you, what this world needs more than anything else is Jesus in their lives. Our world is in a mess, folks. It's mess. It's, it's divided. It's, you know, there's so much skepticism. There's agnostics. There's so many negative things going on. And folks, Jesus is the answer. He's the answer to everything. And and these wise men were seeking the king of the Jews and they saw this star. And we can call it the star of Bethlehem. Some people call it the Christmas star. There's all kinds of things that call it. But this particular star stood out. It stood out. It wasn't one that you could miss. Okay? It was a huge star. It was a bright star. And light, Jesus is light. Think about this. Think about the Old Testament and the glory of God. Think about the children of Israel. All right, it was a cloud by day and it was a fire by night. The star is in, uh, you know, two parts and in three of the Gospels in the Christmas story. So this star is extremely important. And they had heard of this and they knew about the Messiah. They knew this Christ child was going to be born. So they went and they were seeking Jesus Christ. Hold your finger there and go to Jeremiah 29 with me. Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says the Lord... Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. Folks, we all need peace. We all need hope in our lives. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. Folks, in these dark times, in these troubled days, we have prayer. We have prayer that we can have in our lives. Prayer is communication with God. God is there. He is with us 24-7, 365 days of the year. He is there and He is close as the mention of His name. And here's the verse I wanted you to hear. And you will seek Me and find Me when you search for Me with all of your heart. Folks, we need to seek God in everything we do. 
We need to pray to God about everything we do. We need to include God in everything we do. We need to, this Christmas season, tell people about the Christ child. Why He has come. So we see these wise men who used their own money and the finances and spent days and months on the road looking for this star, finding this star, because they knew if they found that star, they would find the promised Messiah, the King of the Jews. Well, let's look at verse 3. Not only the wise men, the troubled king. And when I say troubled, folks, he had issues. All right? Let me break it down for you. He was messed up. All right? He was, even some people would call deranged. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Okay? Uh, people said he was even paranoid. Okay? He, he was afraid. They even called him king of the Jews, even though he wasn't a, a, a full Jew. All right, if you look historically and see what was going on in his life, he was called Herod the Great, and he was an Edomite. And he actually married a Jewish person to make, uh, make it better uh, and be able to uh, rule. And he was under Roman rule there, and so he had to get along with these folks. But he had been married nine times. He had killed one wife and her two brothers, He executed one of his sons and then later on executed two more of his sons. When I say troubled, folks, I mean troubled beyond. Beyond. He was just paranoid. He thought somebody was going to take his kingdom from him. He was always worried. He always thought, you didn't cross this guy. If you crossed this guy, you would die. You would die. And it says, and when they had gathered all... Trouble, excuse me, and all Jerusalem with him. And that's because word got around. Okay, these were Gentiles. These wise men were not Jewish. They didn't dress like Jews. You know, you know their, their entourage stood out. And they're going around town asking the question, asking the question, where is he? Where is this king of the Jews? And so word got back uh, to Herod, and he was troubled. And it says, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. He wanted to know about that. Who is this king of the Jews they're talking about? Who is this Christ child? Verse 5, so he said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people. So even his advisor gave him Scripture. And folks, we're talking about Old Testament prophecy. And you realize there are over 300 Old Testament prophecies about Jesus. That's what I love about the Bible, folks. The Old Testament, uh, you know, is, you know, equals and is parallel with the New Testament. And the New Testament, the Old. When you read the New Testament, you can look back and see that many times they are quoting the Old Testament. And so here it says Bethlehem is called the house of bread. And we know that Jesus was the bread of life. We know uh, the rulers, you know, who who were rulers there. uh, Again, kings and and rulers were just man rulers. But this ruler was going to be different. This was the ruler in that verse with a capital R speaking of Jesus Christ ruling and shepherding God's people. In verse 7 said, Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, and again, folks, secretly is not good. Okay? Secret meetings. Secret votes. Secret. We can just go on and on about it determine from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring him word back to me that I may come and worship him. Can I quote you? Can I, can I quote this? Liar, liar, pants on fire. He was lying big time. This child... This Christ child was a threat to him. 
he considered himself to be king of the Jews. And he was going to do anything to stop this child from being born. Folks, I am telling you, and I want to say it again, life begins at conception. Life begins at conception. And abortion is wrong, folks. And this, even what he did, it is bizarre. You, it just blows your mind. Uh, skip down to verse 13. Now when they, this is Mary and Joseph, had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. Okay? Dreams. Many times God spoke to people through dreams. Sometimes it was an angel of the Lord that spoke to them. Sometimes I believe it was just the Holy Spirit speaking to them. And they said, get out of there. Herod is crazy. He's nuts. He's fixing to do something crazy. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. Why do you leave right then? Why do you leave in a message when you hear that right then? Because you couldn't sleep anyway. Our baby, our child, he was wanting him dead. He was wanting him dead. So they did not wait. And there was, uh, and there uh, it was until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, out of Egypt, I call my son. And you can find that in Hosea 11.1. 1. Now look at verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. Folks, he lost it. He lost it. He wasn't thinking properly. He was deranged. All right? And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Can you imagine having a newborn son that day? Can you imagine the pain and the hurt that would happen? Folks, I am telling you, Satan would do anything to stop the hand of God. Satan is the enemy, folks. He is the enemy. And we have to realize that greater is He who is in us than He who is in the world. Herod had a plan. And God stopped that plan as far as finding baby Jesus. And He carried out a plan which was the It was just crazy. You, you can't even get a word. I can't even think of a word in our vocabulary strong enough of what he had done, folks. So we see the wise men. We see the troubled king. And also, we see the greatest gift ever. And when they heard the king, verse 9, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood where the young child was was getting away from Herod the wise men continued to seek and what it told me was that the star was not always visible it came and went and came and went and again folks I believe it was the divine protection of God I think he can blind lost people that he can blind people so that they cannot see his will and his way and so the star reappeared and these wise men began to seek Him also. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. They had seen the star again. Oh folks, I am telling you, the star is Jesus Christ. The star is the light of the world. The star is the man as Phil's song, who lived a perfect life, who was misjudged, who was beaten, who was crucified, but after three days, he arose again. It is the star of Bethlehem. It is the star of David. Some people call that. 
And when they found this star, they rejoiced. And I notice the description, exceedingly great. All right? That is, you, you can't say it's kind of like the gift. What is the gift? It's exceedingly great. What is the gift? The joy of a Savior being born. They had found the star and they had found Jesus Christ. And I want to just say this as a side little note here. Speaking of bright stars, tomorrow, Monday, December the 21st, a rare Christmas star called the Star of Bethlehem will be seen. It has not been seen in over 800 years. The two largest planets in our solar system, Jupiter and Saturn, will, all li- will align to create this extremely bright star. Some think that this star of Bethlehem could be an announcement of the coming Messiah, Jesus. And you know what I say to that? Even come now, Lord Jesus. To see this star, you can see it tomorrow. You need to look to the southwest 45 minutes after sundown. The last time this star appeared was in the year 1226. Now folks, I'm not telling you to go get on your house like some did and you know, when prophecies were, you know, told and wait there and watch for the star. But folks, I, I'm telling you, and I'm not predicting anything. All right, someone else predicted that. I'm simply saying it could happen. Jesus Christ. Folks, I believe the time is now. The time is now. If you are going to do something for God, if you're going to do something for Jesus, now is the time. Look at verse 11. And when they had come into the house, notice it was a house. It wasn't a stable. Okay, and I'm not trying to break tradition of Christmas, but it was a house. It was a year later. They saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. The presence of God. God in human flesh. And the only thing, and folks, I am telling you, People say, you know, what is the first thing you're going to do when you get into heaven? Well, I'm going to ask God this. You know what? I don't think you are. I think once you get inside the gate, you will bow down and you will worship the King of kings and lords of lords before you do anything else. You are in the Shekinah glory of God. You are in the presence of God and Jesus. When they had opened their treasures... They presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, we know, is extremely expensive. It was a sign of royalty. Frankincense was an incense, and it showed us signs of his deity. His deity, his royalty, his deity. And myrrh was uh, some type of perfume, and it spoke of his humanity. Jesus was all of those And I believe with all my heart that all that happened there, it happened uh, because they needed money. That that would help them fund going to Egypt because Mary and Joseph were really, really poor. Verse 12, and then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Oh, listen to me, church. Listen to me. Wise men still seek Jesus. Folks, we need to be wise about every decision that we make. We need to be wise about everything that comes out of our mouth. We need to be wise about Jesus coming again. Folks, He is coming again. Now, turn with me to the last Scripture. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And I want you to see another announcement. Another announcement. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, watching over their flock by night. And this was before the birth of Christ. We spoke of a year later, but this was before the birth of Christ. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, And the glory of the Lord 
shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Folks, a bright light. A bright light. Folks, we need to go to the light. I think of Saul, who eventually became Paul. What happened on the road to Damascus? He was blinded by a bright light. It shows God's glory. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Good tidings is the gospel. Good news is the gospel. It is for everyone. It's not just joy. Today could be the happiest day of your life. For there is born unto you this day in the city of David a Savior, capital S, Only Jesus can save you from your sins. Only Jesus can forgive you of your sins. Only Jesus can cleanse your heart and cleanse your mind. Only Jesus, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swallowing clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly host praising God saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill towards men folks I'm here to tell you as a minister of the gospel the greatest gift ever given wasn't given on Christmas day it was given and I know we celebrate but they're, they're saying that might not even have been the day We are not celebrating a day. We are celebrating a person. We are celebrating Jesus Christ. The greatest gift ever given did not come in a box. It wasn't with wrapping. It was the Almighty Son of God. That was the greatest gift. You know why? Because that gift doesn't wear out. That gift doesn't... I know one time we were opening presents and one of the little kids said... Is that all we have? You just opened 17 presents. I think you're okay. Folks, the greatest gift given is Jesus Christ the Lord. You know, in response, I see three things. Three things. How today view people view Jesus. The first response was what Herod did. He hated him. He hated him. He was threatened by him. And the world does that. They, you know, when we even say Jesus, don't give me that stuff. Don't give me that Bible stuff. And they reject Jesus because of hatred. And then the scribes and Pharisees, you know, they just they were indifferent to him. Just indifferent. Okay, hey, you can have your Jesus. You know, if that's what you want to do, we don't believe he's the Messiah. We don't believe he's going to change the world. We certainly don't believe he's going to rise from the dead. People are indifferent to him. But the third people, which were the wise men, were true seekers. And they loved Jesus. And they worshipped Jesus. Oh, listen to me. Wise men still seek Him. So I ask as we close this message, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Folks, the greatest gift you could get Today, if you don't know Him, the greatest gift you could get today was the gift of Jesus Christ. The birth of Jesus Christ. The life of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. And along with that, everlasting life. You will not live forever on this world. You won't. So I ask you, are you sure that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven. And if you cannot say that, if you are not sure, my prayer is today you would accept this gift, the greatest gift given to mankind, Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, thank You for this day. And God, I thank You for Scripture. God, it's not me just giving my opinion here. God, it's the Word of God. The Christmas story is not what a lot of people think it is. It's not just another nice story. It's the birth of a king. 
It is Jesus Christ. It is the virgin birth. It was God in human flesh. And God, I pray that if there's one here that doesn't know you, that they would just give their heart and their life to you today. What a great gift. What a great day. You could remember it. You could remember the day that the, you were saved. So God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just convict hearts today. And God, I pray the rest of us, that we would just be wise men and wise women. God, I pray that we would just seek you with all of our heart. God, I pray that we would put you number one in our lives. And God, I pray that we would just uh, pray and, and, and encourage people in the word. God, I pray that everything we say and everything we do would glorify our God and our Savior. God, thank you that you are Emmanuel. You are God with us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that's inside of us. And God, I just pray that we sometime this week would just tell God, thank you. Thank you for sending the greatest gift ever. God, this is your church. This is your invitation. God, we give it to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to, in, to you in any way, would you come?